We all know the story of Noah and the flood, but according to some researchers, there could be as many as 200 different deluge stories from ancient cultures throughout the world. So this begs the obvious question. In terms of science, what single causality could yield such a global diversity of deluge stories? For that, we look back to 1940, when a Chilean astronomer by the name of Carlos Ferrada first postulated an explanation that accounts for all of these deluge stories. An explanation based on two objects. One he calls the black star, and the other an object he called Hercobolus, or what we know today as Planet X, or Nibiru. According to Ferrada, Hercobolus is a large comet planet charged with cosmic energy in an elliptical orbit between the two suns of our own solar system, Sol and its smaller, dark twin, Nemesis. A man of great intellect and insight, Ferrata tells us that this object does not follow established celestial laws, which in turn explains its bizarre behaviors. He also predicts that during this next coming flyby, this massive object will come within 14 million kilometers of Earth, and that it will be naked eye visible from every point of the globe. Yes, we will all see it, and we will photograph it. But when will we all come to believe our own eyes? Well, that might be quite another thing. Hopefully, it will be in time for us to find safety from the coming cataclysm. And what shall that be? It will be a horrific event predicted by Edgar Cayce, a great American psychic known as the Sleeping Prophet. A pole shift. And so, what would the celestial mechanics of such an event look like? It would look like the one that haunted Ferrata in this 1999 interview late in his life. There are so many things which is unfortunate. Mankind is not ready. The change comes. The destruction comes. And above all, will affect humanity in its existence, in its production, and in its own substance. As our research team watched Ferrada in this interview, what tore at our hearts were not his words, but rather the obvious pain of awareness etched on his face. We know that pain all too well, for it is an echo of our own and the knowing of a horrific cataclysm to come, and that which causes it. And so we call it the Farada Casey Pole Shift, and it will happen when these massive objects pass close enough to gain a lithosphere lock on the Earth, thereby pulling the skin of our planet around. This will cause the pole shift predicted by Edgar Casey over 90 years ago. Carlos Ferrata first began talking about Hercobolus, or what we call Planet X, Nibiru, in 1940. And through all those decades of talking to audiences and giving TV interviews, in the back of his mind, you know he was seeing the celestial mechanics of the coming global cataclysm we're going to experience. And, you know, it makes you wonder. How did he see it in his mind? Well, what we're going to try and attempt in this program is to convey a sense of that to you as we explore that coming pole shift.
In this program, we're going to take you into the future to show you a cataclysm that means, well, frankly, the end of life as we know it. But it will not be the end of us. Rather, humanity has a long journey ahead of it. And this is just going to be one waypoint along the path. But, as with all journeys, they do have a beginning. And that beginning for us is that first dawn of awareness about what is to come. And for that, we go to the past. In the first program in the Planet X 101 series, Who, What, When, Where, Why, and How, we explained how the search for Planet X first began in 1781. However, the chronological starting point for our journey today is much closer to our own time. In 1940, a Chilean astronomer by the name of Carlos Muñoz Ferrada first began talking about an object he called Hercobolus, or what we know today as Planet X or Nibiru. But he also talked about not one, but two objects. Hercobolus is the same planet Zachariah Sitchin, author of The Twelfth Planet, describes as Nibiru, according to his translations of the ancient Sumerian texts. And according to Sitchin, it is four times the size of Earth. But of even greater concern to us is the black sun, as Farada calls it. A binary twin to our own sun that is 56 times the size of Earth. And it is the core object of a mini-constellation we call the Planet X system which in turn orbits around our own sun, much like a comet would. Therefore, Farada is the pivotal figure in this program because he was the first professional astronomer to talk about the Planet X system, as we call it, back in 1940. The small sun he referred to as the Black Sun is actually a brown dwarf star known to present-day astronomers as Nemesis. Brown dwarfs are small protostars that lack the mass to sustain hydrogen fusion like Sol. Consequently, they are very dark stars and extremely difficult to find. It is why they are also referred to as failed stars. In fact, the existence of brown dwarf stars wasn't theorized until the 1960s, and back then they were initially called black dwarfs. Consequently, it wasn't until 1988 before the first brown dwarf was discovered, and as of 2012, over 1,800 of these brown dwarf stars have been discovered. We know them today as brown dwarfs thanks to American astronomer Jill Tarter, who first coined the term in 1975. It's interesting to note that the protagonist, Ellie Arroway, played by Jodie Foster, was based on Tartar's astronomical work. The modern hunt for Planet X began with the Deep Space Probe's Pioneer 10 launched in 1972 and Pioneer 11 launched in 1973. These missions established the existence of something of substantial mass because it had significantly altered the trajectories of both probes. In 1983, the infrared astronomical satellite, IRAS, was launched to image that mass. According to NASA, IRAS failed before the mission could be completed. However, several government whistleblowers have since come forward to say IRAS had in fact imaged Planet X. It is also important to know that the disclosures of these whistleblowers are consistent with the news accounts of that time. Most notable was a New York Times article published on January 30, 1983, which states, More credence was given to the hypothesis that a brown dwarf accounts for the mysterious force. Moreover, a brown dwarf in the neighborhood might not reflect enough light to be seen far away, said Dr. John Anderson of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Keep that name in mind as we move forward to 1988. This is a 2013 capture of Dr. John Anderson's NASA biopage, 
So what we know about this astronomer is that he does indeed work for NASA and that he has been following the topic of Planet X for years. Frankly, he's in a league of his own as the last of the honest NASA astronomers to come forward on this topic. In a June 14, 1988 interview with the Victoria Advocate titled Pioneer 10 Still Searching, Anderson is directly quoted as saying, we have a 90 to 99 percent confidence that Uranus and Neptune are being disturbed and by one candidate for that is a single planet X. Sourced from the Google News service, Yowza.com first published this Victoria Advocate interview with Dr. Anderson on March 18, 2012 in an article titled The Planet X Cover-Up in the Mainstream Media. Immediately after publication of that article, the entire Victoria Advocate edition for that day was removed from the Google News Service site. No doubt, our tax dollars at work once again. Redactions aside, 1988 was still a bellwether year for Planet X research thanks to the efforts of Dr. Robert S. Harrington, Chief Astronomer for the United States Naval Observatory, because in October of that year he published a paper titled The Location of Planet X. And here you see Dr. Harrington being interviewed by Zachariah Sitchin, author of The Twelfth Planet, for a network documentary. In that interview, Dr. Harrington showed Sitchin an orbital diagram for Planet X. Interestingly enough, in this illustration created by Dr. Harrington, we see the description, Orbit of Nibiru. The very same planet that Sitchin maintains exists according to his translation of the ancient Sumerian texts. It is likewise noteworthy that Harrington commissioned the construction of a special telescope for a Planet X sky survey which was conducted in 1991 at the Black Birch Observatory in New Zealand. Those observations were based on Harrington's calculations, and the films were delivered directly to NASA and never seen again. And in a manner of speaking, neither was Harrington. As reported in our Yowza.com article, Planet X and the Mysterious Death of Dr. Robert Harrington, this courageous astronomer died on January 23, 1993, from a rapid onset of esophageal cancer. Many believed he was assassinated, as do we. Today, NASA has replaced the Planet X research of men like Anderson and Harrington with a Planet X debunker by the name of David Morrison, a man who maintains that Planet X does not exist and who never misses an opportunity to humiliate anyone with an interest in the topic. So, in response to David Morrison, I offer my first Planet X article published in January 2002 as way of introducing a pithy insight from the man who helped me to write that article. He was Dr. Brian Joffrey Marsden, and at that time he was a senior astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Regrettably, he passed away in 2010, and to honor his memory, I believe something he once told me is the best way to respond to David Morrison. The failure to observe an object only means that you have failed to observe the object. It should be noted that following the mysterious death of astronomer Robert Harrington in 1993, the Planet X topic went dark in the mainstream media because it had become a death topic. And with that, we now take a big step forward to the year 2006. On April 26, 2006, Yowza.com was the first to break the story on the South Pole Telescope in terms of Planet X. The SPT, as it is commonly referred to as, is a 10-meter diameter telescope located at the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica. Simply put, 
It is the ideal infrared telescope for observing anything rising up from the southern skies, like the Planet X system and its brown dwarf. The official reasons given for constructing this telescope in the most inhospitable region of the world sound noble, but in fact do not justify the expense. The Admonson Scott South Pole Station is only accessible by way of specially modified C-130 aircraft. Consequently, flying in the telescope and its support building was a Herculean effort. This is why the same exact science could have been done for a fraction of the cost elsewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. So, why not save the money with a better location? Well, as we pointed out in our article, this was the ideal place to observe the southern approach of the Planet X system at that time. Then came the news we hoped for in 2008. A whistleblower posted Planet X images taken with the SPT on YouTube under the name Nibiru Shock 2012. Here you see the images he posted in his video that were captured by the SPT in January 2008. What is clearly obvious here is that we are looking at a mini constellation and not a single object. So let's take an enhanced look at these images. What we see is the strong infrared signature of a brown dwarf star and between five to seven planets in orbit around it depending on how you define a planet. In this close-up provided by Nibiru Shock 2012, he also points out that the brown dwarf has a tail. This can be attributed to the fact that Nemesis, the brown dwarf seen here in the center of the image, is surrounded by a massive dust disk. Ergo, if we could actually see this brown dwarf in space, it would likely look something similar to this animation. The problem this presents for us here on Earth is that at some point in the future we will pass through this dust disk if we're not already doing so. In addition to the January 2008 images provided by Nibiru Shock 2012, a second whistleblower came forward in May of that year with another SPT image. This second whistleblower named his SPT source in the video, and the government removed it within hours after it was up. With this in mind, we have redacted that information so that for the first time, you can see what his source provided him. And this brings us to the final step in our pole shift chronology. On February 11, 2013, we published our YouTube video titled Object of Interest as Seen from the Turrialba Volcano. Using surveillance camera images captured from the Turrialba Volcano, we began ongoing observations of an object I initially dubbed Blue Bonnet on January 7th of that year. The site for this surveillance camera is on the 10th parallel and at an altitude of approximately 11,000 feet with a clear view to the southwest. Our analysis also shows that this object entered the constellation Ophiuchus on December 1, 2012 and was well inside that constellation as of December 21, 2012. This means that the prophecy of Nostradamus for this object was in fact fulfilled exactly as predicted. Blue Bonnet, as we first called it, is near the sun, and so with all objects near to the sun, it can only be observed before sunrise or before sunset. Also note, we eliminated all of the expected explanations for this object, such as it being the planet Venus, which it is not. In fact, this is not a cataloged object and it has been observed from this location with not one, but with three uniquely different camera systems since early 2010. Having captured literally hundreds of images of this object ourselves, we began to wonder if Blue Bonnet, as we called it, was actually Nibiru, the outermost orbital of the Planet X system. Well, we got an answer. On July 12, 2013, a video titled, A Cyclical Storm Bruise, 
was posted by the Zero Zero Skyview team. This highly capable group of amateur astronomers confirmed our suspicion that we had in fact been observing Nibiru all this time. In their video, they state, we have researched the object and here are our findings. Here you see our object, Blue Bonnet, which we now know to be Nibiru, and which has been observed since early 2010 from surveillance cameras at the Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica. Likewise, the Zero Zero Skyview team also confirms that we first observed it in the constellation Ophiuchus. According to their findings, Nibiru, or Blue Bonnet, if you will, is the outermost orbital of the Planet X system. Please keep in mind that the celestial mechanics of what is going to happen in our near future are so complex that it's really impossible to say with any certainty exactly what is going to happen and when. But what we can do is give you an idea of the factors that are involved. We call them the Planet X system attributes, such as size, speed, and mass, and we're going to be talking about those. But first, I just want to take a brief moment to talk about, well, a different kind of attribute. It's the sixth plague from the ten plagues of Exodus, and we're talking about the boils. Now, this is going to be caused by volcanic ash, and this ash will fall on unexposed skin, and if it's not washed off, will cause very painful boils. And so if there's anything that you're going to remember from this program, I want you to remember this one thing. When you get the ash on your body, wash it off. If you don't have water, use fresh dirt or clay, but wash it off. And now, let's take a look at those attributes. In the opening of this program, we had a feature piece on Carlos Ferrada, and when I watched that for the first time, it really tore me up. Because as a Planet X researcher, I could see in my mind what he was seeing, and in his mind, and it's hard. It presses down on the soul. Yet, there's just no way to know exactly what's going to happen, so the best thing you can do is to at least understand the celestial mechanics of it at a basic level. And that's what we're going to tackle next with Planet X system attributes. Before computers, we'd have to spend all day at the library hoping to get at least part of an answer to a burning question. But today, all it takes is a few keystrokes, and the next thing we know, the question is delivered to an electronic ether, and from there, back pops an answer. But once we have precise questions about when a certain thing will happen with regard to the Planet X system, what we get back is a rat's nest of orbital irregularities that cannot be reconciled. Why is this? In 1962, a Japanese astronomer by the name of Yoshidi Kozai explained why it is so difficult to get a precise answer to a simple question. It is called the Kozai Mechanism, and it describes the complexities of how the orbits of objects affect each other in space. It also tells us that the more objects you have, the more complex the solution becomes. And in the case of a Planet X system flyby, there is simply not enough computing power on the surface of the Earth to give a precise answer to a simple question. But beneath the surface of the Earth, such power may exist. It was recently announced that IBM has developed what are called fluidic computers, and they mimic the brain's design with liquid-based transistors suspended in an ionic liquid that acts much like the neurons in our brains. 
While we're only hearing about the civilian applications today, for the last decade our government has been using several of these fluidic computers in underground facilities and their computing power is simply awesome. To understand the power of just one fluidic computer, let's begin with a supercomputer such as those used by governments and universities today. Keeping this supercomputer in mind, imagine that you could multiply its numbers by 100 times to create a computing cloud of 100 supercomputers, all working together to process the same data. Then multiply that cloud of 100 supercomputers 100 times, and what you'll have is the computational power of just one fluidic computer. Is that enough computing power to unsnarl a rat's nest of cosi mechanism orbital solutions? Only our government has the answer to that question, and as we know, they do not share well with others. Nonetheless, we humans have amazing computational skills because we have the ability to tap into cosmic consciousness, a powerful source that dwarfs anything possible, even with fluidic computers. Two such men who have tapped into the power of this cosmic consciousness are astronomer Carlos Ferrada and Edgar Cayce, the sleeping prophet. Like Edgar Cayce, Ferrada had a special gift. He could enter into trance when he was researching, and while in this state, he could write and draw the cosmic knowledge he received. It is how he developed his theory of geodynamics, which is based on the attractions of heavenly bodies, large explosions in the sun, and the cycles of geophysical disturbances. It is also why, when I see Farada's deep sadness, that it cuts me like a knife because I know he has seen with cosmic clarity the coming flyby of Hercobolus and the Black Star, and it is not a wondrous thing to behold. Rather, it is horrifying. And with that, let's begin a simple overview of what we call the Planet X system attributes, beginning with speed. According to Zachariah Sitchin, the word Nibiru means the planet of crossing. And according to Farada, its speed when it's at its closest distance to Nemesis is 92 kilometers a second. Farada also tells us that when it is at its closest distance to our Sun, it is traveling at a speed of 76 kilometers a second. But what is really interesting is that while it is on the long legs of its journey, so to speak, Nibiru is traveling at a whopping speed of 300 kilometers a second. In terms of complexity, this makes the Planet X system a Kozai mechanism poster child on steroids. No wonder our government is spending vast sums of money on underground fluidic computers. Meanwhile, what will those of us on the surface see as Nibiru moves along its orbital path? Well, that depends if it's coming or going in its orbit, relative to us. Astronomers use the term blue shift to describe what we're seeing when an object is coming towards us. With blue shift, the light waves are compressed, and so the object appears bluish to us. Conversely, when an object is going away from you, it appears reddish because the light waves become elongated. Ergo, when it's coming at us, it's blue, and when it's going away, it's red. In this January 23, 2014 image of Nibiru, captured with the third camera system installed at the Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica, one cannot help but wonder if we are seeing Nibiru turning back in its orbit around Nemesis. No doubt we will see more cycles of blue shift and red shift before this flyby of the Planet X system through the core of our own inner system is over, which also explains the ancient Hopi prophecy called the Blue Kachina prophecy. The Blue Kachina prophecy tells us that we will see a blue object in the sky which will be a harbinger of trouble. Following that, we will see a red Kachina and it will cause a great suffering for us. 
The Hopi assure us that this happened before and that it will happen again. This now brings us to the attribute of size. We live on Earth and so it is natural that we humans have an Earth-centric view of the cosmos. Consequently, when it comes to long distances in space, the core measurement is called an astronomical unit, which is roughly the distance from the Earth to the Sun. For this reason, we'll likewise use an Earth-centric model to define the sizes of Nibiru and Nemesis. According to Zechariah Sitchin's translations of the ancient Sumerian texts, Nibiru is the size of four Earths. And according to Carlos Ferrada, the nemesis brown dwarf he calls the black star is the size of 55.5 Earths. Granted, when it comes to fishing and sex, size matters. However, when it comes to the impending pole shift, it's all about mass. In terms of a pole shift resulting from a flyby of the Planet X system through the core of our system, mass and not size is the key measure. In his book, The Time Machine, author H.G. Wells presents a scenario in which our moon is fractured as the result of reckless mining and construction techniques. The result is that humanity is also fractured into the peaceful Eloi and the monstrous Morlocks who feed upon them. This is a very real scenario because of something called tidal force. To put this in context, imagine that the moon was to suddenly disappear, in which case the entire surface of the earth would collapse approximately 18 inches. No doubt, that would most likely result in an extinction level event for humanity. So in terms of a pole shift event, where the gravitational force of Nibiru and Nemesis gain a lithosphere lock on our planet, these forces will pull the skin of our planet around. Again, size doesn't matter. Rather, the pole shift force will equal mass plus distance. With this in mind, our best estimates for mass are as follows. We give Harrington's Planet X two to three Earth masses. For Nemesis, we place that at 24,726 Earth masses, and that's no lightweight. In the final analysis, what will drive the pole shift is what we know as the three golden rules of premium real estate. Location, location, and location. Ergo, where are we in relationship to Nibiru and Nemesis when they come closest to us during the flyby? Now that we've covered the basic Planet X system attributes, we're ready to move forward with a look at some flyby scenarios. Next up, we're going to present three different Planet X system flyby scenarios. Please note, these are not predictions. Also note that what does apply here are the three golden rules of premium real estate. Location, location, location. Where are we in relation to it as it is coming around the sun? Now to help put that in context, we're going to first explore a concept called catastrophism. In my book, Crossing the Cusp, Surviving the Edgar Cayce Pole Shift, I present an explanation of how life evolved on this planet. It's called catastrophism, and it predates what we currently teach, which is Darwinism. Like creationism, catastrophism tells us that the cycle of evolution goes through long periods of quiescence, punctuated by brief moments of extreme violence which reorder life on the planet. Catastrophism, like Darwinism, is based on data, whereas creationism is based on belief. Therefore, there are no arbitrary time frames. 
This is because Darwinism and catastrophism are based on a deep time understanding of the evolution of life on our planet. And what we are about to encounter will be one of those brief moments of extreme violence that reorders life on our planet. But in our first scenario, we're just not going to reorder life on a planet, we're going to destroy it. Phaeton is a hypothetical planet. What happened to Phaeton was a catastrophic event that tore the planet apart, sending its fragments flying out into space. These fragments then became the asteroid belt that now exists between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So, our first Planet X system flyby scenario will be a Phaeton event. Here we see Earth on the opposite side of the Sun. But poor Phaeton is a bone to be chewed as Nibiru and Nemesis close in on it. This, we postulate, was the destructive force that tore poor Phaeton apart. Visitors who take the Universal Studios tour of the Red Sea scene from the movie, The Ten Commandments, are given a great insight to a real feat of cinema magic. However, when we remove the magic and the allegory from the story and reorder the plagues in scientific order, the first plague of Exodus becomes number seven, thunder and hail. What the reordered story of Exodus tells us is that meteorite showers falling on us from the dust disk surrounding Nemesis is the first plague. This plague will repeat itself as Earth is pelted by this dust disk we'll see meteorite showers the likes of which we could not imagine. The damage of these meteorites will be substantial and long-lasting because they'll contain something called shreversite, a deadly combination of iron, nickel, and phosphorus only found in meteoric iron. The iron in the shreversite is what caused the first plague in the biblical account, namely the turning of the waters to blood. To understand why, simply visit a local brickyard. They'll tell you that in order to make those wonderful red bricks we use to decorate our homes with, they add iron to the mix. This is why the iron in the Shrever site will once again turn our waters to the color of blood, and it will result in a dramatic reduction in potable drinking water for all of us. Meanwhile, the phosphorus in the Shrever site plus warmer surface temperatures, such as those we're already seeing these days, will trigger huge blooms of blue-green algae. These algae blooms will generate vast amounts of microcystin, which is highly toxic and can kill plants, animals, and humans. And here in our illustration of the Exodus scenario, we find Earth on the opposite side of the sun, just as it was during the Phaeton event scenario, with one notable exception. This time, there is no Phaeton. So, what we've seen with these first two scenarios is that Earth was fortunate enough to be on the other side of the Sun during this final stage of the Planet X system flyby. So, what happens if we are not so lucky the next time? In a 2008 Project Camelot interview, Government whistleblower Bob Dean announced that our worst fears would be realized during this coming flyby. That Earth would be on the wrong side of the Sun as the Planet X system began its downward track back into the furthest reaches of our solar system. No doubt astronomer Carlos Ferrada saw this as well when he predicted that during this coming flyby, Nibiru will come within 14 million kilometers of the Earth. Consequently, the pole shift, as envisioned by Carlos Ferrada and predicted by Edgar Cayce, will happen for the very reason given by whistleblower Bob Dean, that Earth is just simply going to be at the wrong place and at the wrong time, and so it will be a real tribulation for humankind. First will come increased seismicity, which is already happening, followed by increased volcanism, which also is already happening. Then there will be the deep impact events that many of our modern astronomers and scientists are warning us about. And then will come the tidal forces of Nibiru and Nemesis as they gain a lithosphere lock on Earth, 
Then they'll pull the skin of our planet around. So now the big question is, will the pole shift happen in our lifetime? Well, the government knows for certain because they've got the fluidic computers. But, as the old saying goes, they don't share well with others. The best we can do in the meantime is, well, take our best shot and you decide. novelist Ray Bradbury put it most eloquently when he said, something wicked this way comes. So then the issue is, by what route, or trajectory if you will. We're going to look at that next. But also we're going to look at something I call the backside. Whenever I do a podcast or a video, I always close with, and this is Marshall, and I'll see you on the backside. So what is the backside? Well, it's when we see blue skies once again. So, let's get started. This pole shift trajectory forecast begins with an anonymous hero, a government whistleblower only known to us as Nibiru Shock 2012, who first revealed images acquired from the South Pole Telescope in January 2008 of the Planet X system. In these enhanced images he presented, he shows us a brown dwarf mini constellation with its own planets and moons. And what is interesting is that this brown dwarf has a tail, which tells us it is going to be an awfully dirty thing. Then on October 10, 2012, the Zero Zero Skyview team released their video, A Dark Binary Star, and the object they were viewing with a highly advanced amateur telescope bears a striking resemblance to the one captured with the SPT in January 2008. And there are others. On July 28, 2013, we published our video, Planet X System Observations and Orbital Analysis, with our own observation of Nemesis made by Jorge Arena during a business trip to Lima, Peru. On the last leg of his journey from El Salvador to Peru, he captured this rare image of Nemesis through the clouds at the sun's 7 o'clock position. Then on January 10, 2014, YouTuber Stargazer Nation posted a feed capture from the Soho Lasco C3 camera. In it, we clearly see Nemesis, or the Black Star as Carlos Ferrata called it, again near the sun's 7 o'clock position. Frankly, we were amazed to see that he got this imagery, as we routinely see these kinds of images scrubbed off the Soho site nearly as fast as they go up. But like they say, the early bird gets the worm. And so our hats are off to Stargazer Nation for a brilliant piece of citizen journalism. He nailed it. The nemesis brown dwarf star is the smaller companion to our own soul. And like soul, nemesis has its own planets as well. Of particular interest to us is its outermost planet, Nibiru. We first reported our observations of Nibiru on February 11, 2013, with our video, Object of Interest as Seen from the Turrialba Volcano. Our observation efforts began in mid-December 2012 with an email from an expatriate who lives at the base of the volcano. We subsequently began observing this object on January 5, 2013, which I initially named Blue Bonnet. We tracked it from a surveillance camera at the top of a Costa Rican volcano located 10 degrees north with a clear view to the southwest, called Turrialba. We tracked it a few hours before sunset each day for months and amassed hundreds of image captures from two different surveillance camera systems. Early on, we suspected it was Nibiru, and on July 12, 2013, the Zero Zero Skyview team posted a video titled A Cyclical Storm Bruise, confirming our suspicions. Their finding was that we in fact were observing Nibiru, the outermost orbital of Nemesis, in the constellation Ophiuchus. 
That being said, the linchpin for this pole shift trajectory forecast is not Nibiru. Rather, it can only be one object, Nemesis. For this reason, we'll use the January 10, 2014 Stargazer Nation capture of Nemesis from the SOHO LASCO C3 camera as that linchpin. And so here is our pole shift trajectory forecast starting with the SOHO observation in January of this year. Here we see Nemesis and Nibiru in conjunction with Earth on the opposite side of the Sun, with Nemesis just below the ecliptic and Nibiru just above. Keep in mind, Earth is already seeing evidence of increased solar radiance, resulting in a corresponding increase in seismicity and volcanism. Also keep in mind a 2008 Project Camelot interview with government whistleblower Bob Dean about the coming of Nibiru. In that interview, Dean was quite explicit in his statement that the flyby would occur while Earth and Nibiru are on the same side of the Sun. And so our pole shift alignment forecast is for some time after 2016. We are also very certain that sometime in 2016, both Nibiru and Nemesis will be naked eye visible from everywhere on Earth. This will likely be about the time Nemesis reaches its point of perihelion with Sol, in other words, its closest distance to our Sun. The pole shift event will occur when Nemesis crosses the ecliptic on its outward leg to the furthest reaches of our solar system. At this point, both Nemesis and Nibiru will be in opposition to Earth, and that is when their combined tidal forces will gain a purchase on the lithosphere of our planet, thereby causing a pole shift in which every major body of water will come out of its basin. During this time, we will see both Nemesis and Nibiru, and our planet will also be pelted by the Nemesis dust disk. Also, there will be catastrophic interactions between our Sun and both Nemesis and Nibiru, resulting in catastrophic solar storms which will scorch the surface of our planet. This will be a time when we need to take refuge below ground. Likewise, there will be terrible impact events all throughout this flyby, and these will leave lasting scars on the land and turn our summers into long winters but worse yet will be the earthquakes created by this solar onslaught and the ensuing volcanism. And for those living along the coastlines, death will befall them with brutal walls of hydraulic sandpaper grinding them apart. Then will come the coup d'etat, a catastrophic pole shift event that will be as harsh for those living under the ground in the safety of their bunkers as it will for those living on the surface the elites will suffer harshly as well. And in these times, we will see old lands fall beneath the waves as new lands rise up, and once Nemesis and Nibiru are beyond our sight, we will look up to see an ugly sky. But remember, this too shall pass, and in the fullness of time, this ugliness will fade away from human existence as we enter what I call the backside a time when we see blue skies once again. And as those who survive this flyby start to sort themselves out, Mother Nature will wash clean these new lands with powerful rains, and in time, life will come to the barren wastes. Then in the fullness of time, our planet will once again become a verdant paradise, lush and green. And those who make it to the backside will taste the clean, sweet waters of a new reality. And humanity will once again hear the laughter of children at play. And who will be the ones to survive and to make it to the backside to see those beautiful blue skies once again? I believe it will be those who have chosen to walk humbly with their God. Because the meek truly will inherit the earth. And I'll leave it on that note. So until the next time we meet, remember Marshall's motto. Destiny comes to those who listen and fate finds the rest. So learn what you can learn, do what you can do, and never give up hope. This is Marshall, and I'll catch you on the backside.